Hello, everybody, and thank you for watching this special video interview. Uh, I'm John Spencer Ellis, and that's Tom Terwilliger. And uh, thank you for being here for this, Tom. Appreciate it. Are you kidding? A pleasure. Thanks for inviting me, buddy. <laughs> so uh, this is a tribute to uh, Joe Weider, who we're all in debt to to some degree if you're in the fitness industry, uh, and, uh, and also about leaving a legacy and, and about the legacy that uh, Joe has left. And uh, I, I'm going to uh, throw up a picture here uh, quick, and, and they can see that uh, you won uh, Mr. America and Joe Weider was giving you your trophy. Uh, what year was this? Yeah, that was 1986. That was the first time I had met Joe. And of course, I knew Joe and knew of the Mecca, you know, the Mecca of bodybuilding. And, you know, I tell you, one of the one of the coolest moments of my life was certainly receiving that trophy from Joe. But his whispering in my ear, Tommy, we want to fly you out to California over the next two days. So stay in shape. We want to take lots of pictures, lots of pictures. You're a great <laughs> champion. And I heard that. I was like, on cloud nine, man. I was like, that's <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, but, of course, it ruined the rest of the night, because I had planned to go out and binge, but that couldn't happen. <laughs> well, yeah, and that's pretty stip uh, typical after uh, following a, a bodybuilding oh, yeah. championship. That, that diet's brutal. Um, so I, at, at the time we're recording this, uh, Joe passed away about 24 hours ago. Yeah. And, um, you know, I did a post uh, uh, on Facebook thanking him for what he has done and what he has created for our entire industry. And, and it's funny, I've never had, I put a picture of him, one of his classic photos, and I've never had so many... Uh, Facebook shares, likes, and comments on any single thing that I've ever done. Wow. And, uh, and I think that people understand the magnitude of what he's accomplished. And basically I said, you know, he and maybe two or three other people are responsible for the, the fitness industry and what it's become. And um, you know, what, is the, what is the thing that you remember most about Joe and his legacy? Well, I, I remember certainly you know, about Joe was early on before I began, you know, any semblance of bodybuilding. I was into martial arts like yourself, John, and studying Chinese Kung Fu for several years. And it was in junior high school. And I can't remember exactly what the year is, nor would I actually expose that to everyone. But I remember a buddy of mine came, into, came to my homeroom just before the bell rang and class let out. And he was like literally waiting outside in the hallway. And we had done a little weightlifting, but it was mostly to be stronger for martial arts training. And he had a picture, he had a, uh, he had a magazine with him called Muscle Builder. And on the cover was this like bizarre looking black and white picture of this guy lifting weights and just a freak. You know, just a freak. Of course, at the time, no one knew who he was except for those in the industry. And it was Arnold Schwarzenegger, of course. But that magazine never would have been published. That cover would never have been seen. That inspiration would never have been delivered to me, which literally changed my life forever. Mm -hmm. Forever. It changed the direction I was going and the trouble I was getting into and turned it into something really positive that influenced and became a career. So that magazine never would have been published. So he had such an impact early on. In, with his courage to to expose to the world, to help bring to the world something that was esoteric, that was a subculture that wasn't exposed, that had all sorts of negative connotations attached to it. Instead, he had the courage and the inspiration to bring it to the world, and it changed my life. I know it changed the lives of millions. Oh my gosh, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm looking out to the side here. I have his Wikipedia page pulled up, and um, he published his first magazine, I'm looking for the exact name here, but at age 14, at age 14, um, and it's just yes. amazing. And, and um, his his name is actually Joseph, J-O-S-E-F. Um, <laughs> he was born in Montreal, uh, but uh, the uh, son of uh, Jewish-Polish immigrants that uh, moved to Canada, and then he moved to uh, California uh, sometime later, yeah. and really um, defined not just a generation, but he, I mean, the, here's the thing, you guys, if you are in the fitness industry in any way, shape or form, you owe a thanks to Joe Weider because if it weren't for him and a couple other people like Jack Lane, um, you wouldn't have a job doing what you love because the culture, which he, you know, helped coin the phrase physical culture, uh, is what it used to be called. And, and to some degree, mm -hmm. it is, but physical culture, we're going in the Wayback Machine now. <laughs> uh, he, he helped develop this. You know, uh, the, the weeder weight benches that he mm. used to sell in his magazines. 
the protein powders, uh, the competition. He developed uh, Mr. Olympia, Ms. Yeah. Olympia, the, the Masters Olympia, and so on. And then, Tom, what he about did. some of the magazines he, he developed, which started the, that whole revolution? Like you said, at 14, I actually had a chance to spend a little bit of time with Joe when I ultimately did get out there for that photo shoot following the uh, national championship. And he was there the whole time. He spent a tremendous amount of time with the, with the athletes um, that he had you know, uh, interest with. We wanted to, he, we wanted to encourage. Um, and he shared with me a story that you know, at that age, around 14, 15 years old, he had seen a bodybuilding magazine. And at the time, they were, you know, it's a real subculture stuff. And he decided he wanted to write. He wanted to do this. And he literally started writing, pecking away on his typewriter in his bedroom. His mom wouldn't even let him use the kitchen table. She didn't want it to turn into this, uh, an office for him. So at 14, 15 years old, he's in his bed, covers over, flashlight going, and he's typing away, writing all these articles under different names. And I'm trying to remember the name of the first magazine, but it was something interesting. Um, I think it was called Your Physique. I think you're right. From not it mistaken. is your physique in 1936. 1936. That was yeah. it. He shared, so he shared that story with me, and I thought it was, wow. And to hear those stories, I had an opportunity back in those days to, to spend time with Joe and guys like Artie Zeller, who were, who were he, Artie Zeller was a, a prolific photographer, did a lot of the photography for uh, was your physique, became mm -hmm. muscle builder, became muscle and fitness as we know today. Mm -hmm. So I had an opportunity to kind of get some of the stories directly. So it was a real, a real privilege and an honor to hear Joe tell me a little bit about that history and how he got started in that respect. It was great. We're going to talk a little bit about, you know, why it's important to leave a legacy. You know, we're talking about Joe's legacy, but you know, the, the message now for, you know, the fitness professionals that are watching this and the people who appreciate what it is that Joe's done is how can they, or how can we as fitness professionals, fitness educators, leave a legacy of our own? to whatever degree it is possible and appropriate for us, but how can we also leave a legacy? So I want you to be thinking about that because we're going to get to that in a minute. But um, before we start recording here, uh, I, I found we were talking about the Weider principles. And if you guys aren't familiar with this, you know, Joe Weider developed some strategies for building muscle and for exercise mm -hmm. that you know predated anything in modern uh, the fitness industry. And some of this stuff still applies today. A lot of it still applies today. Um, if uh, like the pre-exhaustion training, if you guys yeah. have, have uh, heard that, and I'm gonna just read this quickly here: uh, pre-fatiguing a larger muscle group with an isolation single jointed movement, so it can be even more exhausted by the compound movements to follow. Yeah. And, and of course, this isn't necessarily sports performance. This is bodybuilding and muscular development. Right. And for me, John, that, that principle alone made a huge difference in terms of my ability to sustain a long-lasting career, a career of almost 20 years in, in the bodybuilding community. Wow. Because, and I'll give you a, a prime example of it, you know, I mean, early on, of course, everyone was heavy squats, uh, you know, uh, leg press. I mean, that's how you built legs, man. But guys were blowing out their knees, blowing out their hips, blowing out their back, getting the first thing on their routine was squats. Boom, they get into it. So I was taught by my mentor, Tony Pandolfo, who had learned directly, literally from Tony Pen uh, from uh, from uh, Joe Weider, this pre-exhaust principle. And as much as physical therapists don't necessarily like the idea of leg extensions, we would pre-exhaust the crap. I would blow those. Uh, we would do four or five sets of leg extensions, descending weight, all sorts of stuff. Blow those legs out on leg extensions like there was nothing left. We got off that machine and we could barely walk. Now it's time to go into squat. You could use 100 pounds less, put less stress on your back, on your joints, mm -hmm. and the muscle was working even harder than it would have been prior to that. So that principle was, was, uh, was uh, you know, huge in terms of my sustainability, and I know for a number of athletes as well. Great Absolutely. principle. And so and, many others. And, too. and again, I think people have to realize that. Obviously, things have changed in the fitness industry, but for doing the bodybuilding figure physique kind of stuff, these are the kind of things that work and still actually work today. It's just that obviously over time, the techniques change a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Uh, uh, pyramids, that's when you'd start with a lighter weight, go up to a heavy point and come back down. That's obviously Right, good. and on the other end of the pyramid, you're dropping the reps. You start with 12 with a lighter weight yeah. and then you go down to six reps. With, yeah, so he started that stuff. And then uh, giant sets. So if, uh, as an example, like, and you guys have all done this stuff. I don't know if you know always what they're called or where this originated, but this all came from Joe Weider. A mm. uh, giant set would be like if you're doing um, chest and you might do like a uh, flat dumbbell press, uh, cable crossover and pec deck, you know, or a butterfly. Back machine, to back. 
Yeah, the, yeah. The round and around and around yeah. like that. That's yeah. a, that's I remember when I first started training, man, early on, and this was back in the uh, in the late 70s or so when, when Weider had been just developing many of these things. And by the way, his development of these strategies, what he called the principles, the Weider principles, came from, in many respects, the athletes that he was working with. Joe, see, Joe wasn't just, he wasn't a, just an entrepreneur, which he was an extraordinary entrepreneur, but he loved the sport of bodybuilding and he loved bodybuilding. And he was in the gym every Every day with these guys, with Schwarzenegger, with Franco Colombo, with Frank Zane, with Dave Draper, with these guys that laid the groundwork for today's modern physique competitors, mm -hmm. you know, and so together they were developing these strategies. They would play with new techniques, new things to up the intensity level. And as a result, these weirder principles emerged, you might say, as things we do today. And those uh, those giant sets, man, you talk about getting a lot of work done in a short period of time and. You know, it's all about that intensity and, and short duration. And that was developed in those, you might say, the bodybuilding proving grounds, the the, uh, the, the science lab of Venice Beach, along with Joe Weider. I'm looking at uh, probably the Weider principle that I've used the most and I think can be used among any sport or fitness uh, type of uh, competition or training, and that is instinctive training. Sometimes mm. they call it intuitive training as well. Um, <clears throat> but instinctive training is basically listening to your body, listening to your heart, your stomach, and, and experimenting with different things and going with the flow of what's yeah. happening that day, that week, in the moment, and kind of asking yourself for a response so you know what's best for you in that moment, regardless right. of what you had maybe thought about doing earlier that day or mm. even the day before. So, mm. How often did you use And that's a huge one. In, in one of the uh, coaching processes, I teach what I call body rapport. And in body rapport, it's all about know, like, and trust your body. And, and the, this weeder principle of instinctive or intuitive training mm -hmm. plays into that uh, uh, on a tremendous basis because it's about listening to the body. You might go into the, into the gym, for example, with a specific routine. I mean, the way I applied it was I knew I was working chest and shoulders maybe that day, possibly even triceps. But I didn't know what I was going to start with. I didn't have a fixed scheduled routine and boy, I'm going to start with 100 pounds, I'm going to add 120 pounds. No, you just kind of get in and instinctively train, listening to your body. So how do you know, like, and trust your body if you're not willing to listen to it and provide you know, the, the, the resources needed to follow through on that? I, I should tell you, John, my favorite weeder principle was the, and still is to this day, in fact, more today than any any time in my career is the lightweight, low reps, short duration training. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of that. Very lightweight, very low repetitions, very short duration training. In other words, I get in, I lift five pounds for two, three reps, five minutes, I'm done, I leave, I'm done. I'm so glad he created that principle because it worked for me for years. <laughs> and as I get older, I adapt more and more of that philosophy. Huge growth for that. <laughs> Um, I want to go over real quick some of the other magazines because he did publishing. I mean, he's he's the one who started the, this publishing empire, um, and of course, um, you know, with his brother uh, Ben as well. Um, yeah. So you know, the magazines are uh, Muscle and Fitness, Flex, Men's Fitness, uh, Shape Magazine. I mean, and there's and there's been others along the way that have come and gone. But wow, I mean, if you think about that, that is a huge publishing empire, and yeah. uh, and also created. Uh, some of the opportunities uh, for you know people who created fitness uh, info products to advertise in his magazine. So he's he's the one who also created some of the first opportunities. So if like if you were a trainer, if you created a, a body transformation system or a gadget to make bigger calves, I remember they used to have those shoes that they used to advertise right. in the old Muscle and Fitness. You know, <laughs> you sprint with them and stuff like that, and and get bigger calves. You know. All that started with Joe Weider and his magazine and the opportunity he created for fitness entrepreneurs. So, Absolutely. You know, just as a, a very specific example, that Bill Phillips, for example. We all know Bill Phillips from Body for Life, and, and he created his own magazine a little bit later on. I can't, the, the name uh, eludes me at the moment. But, but Bill advertised early on. Mm -hmm. um, he had a specific product that reached out to the bodybuilding community and helped increase their knowledge about uh, certain supplements. And... He advertised in, in Weeder magazines left and right, and as a result, uh, developed a, a large a large sum of seed money to start his own, I think it was Muscle Media was the magazine, oh, yeah. and ultimately yeah, his own yeah. products and things yeah. like that. So, so this is just a, a very sound example of how, you're right, entrepreneurs were able to develop 
their ability to reach their customers as a result of what Weeder did, which is fantastic, man. So I want to I want to move to the next phase here, and that is for the people watching this. You know, regardless of where you're at in the fitness industry, sports or bodybuilding or figure physique or you know, uh, boot camp or group X, any of it, it doesn't matter. What are you going to do to leave a legacy? And, and there's a few things you, you do need to think about as you leave a legacy. And, and, and you know, it's kind of weird I mean, because you can have a legacy while you're still here in the physical world as well. And so, mm -hmm. you know, you, it, it doesn't have to be after the fact uh, because, you know, he, he was a living legend, uh, right. you know, for, for many years and, and decades. But you have to have a few things if you want to leave a legacy and, and, and do anything that would resemble what Joe has done to make mm. him proud. Uh, and that is uh, to be prolific. You can't be a wallflower. You can't be um, uh, middle of the road. You have to be opinionated but kind. Uh, you have to be uh, prolific and specific. You do mm. have to take sides. And you have to be willing to take calculated risks and in many times pretty serious risks, all, all, although intelligent risks as well. And, and so what, what do you say? How does, how does someone create a legacy like Joe? I agree with you. If you're not, if you're not at least a little bit controversial, you know, one of the things that, that put uh, Weider on the map is as much as it was his challenge to overcome, and that part of the strengthening of his ability to do what he did was overcoming, you know, what he had a huge controversy. You know, his first competition, his very first uh, competition, which was, uh, was the Mr. Montreal, and uh, he wanted to do something that was bigger than what was being done in these small little auditoriums. Bodybuilding was just something that was connected to powerlifting or weightlifting. And it was sort of like a little bit side freak show thing, you might say. So he wanted to take bodybuilding and make it a little bit more mainstream. And he, he leased out the, the, the biggest theater in Montreal. And they had 1,500 people show up and 80 competitors, which was unprecedented. And literally moments before the competition was began, he got noticed that the AAU had pulled his sanction. He was done. He couldn't, he couldn't run that competition. They decided on the moment, literally on his way, him and Ben decided the IFBB is about to be born. We're going to run this contest. We're going to start our own sanctioning body. Wow. So the reason I bring that up is because for us, for, for as fitness entrepreneurs, sometimes you've got to go up against the mainstream. You've got to be pushed. You know, great heroes are only great heroes as a result of pushing up against resistance. Joe ran into a lot of resistance, including lawsuits, all sorts of problems for years, for decades to come after that. And a lot of it's jealousy, IF too. What's that? A lot of it is jealousy. Yeah, absolutely. No question about it. And, and, and the IFBB grew as a result of that. So he created something in the IFBB, the International Federation of Bodybuilding, that is a legacy as a result of being controversial and willing to take a risk. So you hit it on the nose. If you're middle ground, if you agree with everything everyone else is doing, eh, you don't have a position that's strong enough to entice people to say, hey, what is this guy doing? How I want can to make I share sure that this? people understand exactly what you're saying. People are not familiar with the bodybuilding world. Um, the AAU was the sanctioning body for amateur sports and, to, and, and bodybuilding, as you know, it was becoming known as at that time. Right. And for whatever reason, on the fly, just preceding this event, they say, we don't accept you, we don't acknowledge you. And... He had the instinct and the ability to move quickly, which is a, a, an important thing in entrepreneurship and leaving a legacy, <laughs> is he said, you know what? Good for you. Good for us. Uh, what's the name? IFBB. Okay, great. We are now the IFBB, the International Federation right. of Bodybuilding. Uh, and it became, you know, the, the biggest deal Huge. in the world. Huge. Yeah, I mean, if they had just, if they, if that hadn't happened, if number one, if the resistance hadn't showed up, if they hadn't pulled that sanction, or if they said, well, I guess we can't run this contest. We certainly can't do it unsanctioned. Most of these athletes won't compete. If, they, if the AAU finds out they're competing under a non-sanctioned competition, they may not be able to compete in a Mr. America or, or whatever other competition they might want, in Mr. Universe for that matter, under the AAU umbrella. So they had to convince those 80 athletes, number one, nobody dropped out. Mm -hmm. All those athletes stuck around because they saw something. They said, look at the auditorium win. Look at the number of spectators. Look at the amount of publicity this thing has brought in. This is, it dwarfed anything the AAU was doing. But he had to be able, like you said, act quickly, make very, very quick decisions, and have the courage 
to implement those things. So I think as entrepreneurs, certainly in the fitness industry, and I think that's something, we just hit on something right there. I think a lot of fitness professionals still sort of see themselves only as technicians as opposed to entrepreneurs, as opposed to visionaries in terms of what they can and what they can't do. Joe created, along with his brother, a huge vision, and he found vehicles like Arnold Schwarzenegger, for example, and the IFBB to be able to proliferate that vision. So I think the first thing for fitness professionals is to start expanding your vision. Outside what you do, how can you, if, you, if you're serving dozens now, how can you serve hundreds? If you're serving hundreds already, how can you serve thousands? If you're serving thousands like our good friend JSE here is doing, how do we serve millions, right? Expand that vision and then find the vehicle to be able to make it happen. Yeah, I think there is something to be said about thinking big. And there's a, a, a lot of good books on oh, yeah. thinking big. And, you know, as you grow your business and you develop and create and leave this legacy, it's a matter of what you think is possible but the same amount of work will be done regardless. So, and, and that sounds a little weird, but bear with me a second. <clears throat> so the amount of work involved with thinking big and doing something big and thinking small and doing something small is relatively the same. It's just what you believe is possible, how you learn to leverage time, how you learn to collaborate with other talented people. But the scope of what you can do, the magnitude of your reach and the lives that you can change is only dependent on what you believe is possible and the, and the scope of your vision. But the amount of work is almost identical. And when I first heard that, I thought, what a bunch of BS. Yeah, I really it did. It doesn't sound like it makes sense, and, but it does. But, but it does because it's a matter of how you work and how you think, but not necessarily the amount of work and the amount mm. of thinking. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. In fact, we've all had anyone who's been an entrepreneur who's done things that were, I, I've done things that were small and were tremendous amount of work. Mm -hmm. And then you wind up with little reward. Mm -hmm. And then you go out and do something big, something where you intend to reach a lot of people and you do reach a lot of people or you have an impact or you make a difference. And maybe it takes some investment, some time, some energy, but not much more, like you said, yeah. than it would if it was small. Yeah. But the rewards are so much greater. I think what it does take, though, as opposed to the work, um, is the courage, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, and, and you, and you, and you called it. I mean, we know the process of manifestation is beliefs lead to our thoughts, our feelings, our actions, our results, right? So if we're going to take those actions, they're going to lead to something big. We better develop or at least overcome any beliefs that we may not be able to do that or doubt ourselves or we're not good enough for that. We better develop the beliefs that we can and then the actions will happen. No more work. It's just a matter of having that belief and having the courage to be able to say, yeah, I'm going to get out. Instead of getting out in, a hundred pe in front of 100 people and risking failure, I'm going to get out in front of a million people <laughs> and I'm going to risk failure. But I'm also risking big success too. <laughs> I think one of the things that, that uh, Joe has taught me is that um, you have to do something with the intent of making it last during its inception. So mm -hmm. here's what I mean. And this is the difference between thinking small and thinking big and, and doing good and doing great. And that is that each thing you do, each action you take, each thing you put into motion, personally, professionally, physically, financially, all the other <laughs> isms. <laughs> how, will, how will that single action carry forward? How will this single thing that you do uh, affect more people? How will this mm. single thing that you create last a long time? So it, I'll, give you, I'll give everyone an example. Um, as we're making this video, it's roughly 24, maybe 36 hours after Joe's passing. I sent you a text message yesterday. I said, let's do a tribute to Joe and talk about leaving a legacy. And you got back with me within about five minutes. Uh, and that was uh, on a Saturday. So good for you. And uh, you said, great, let's do it, you know, uh, 12 noon mine time. Perfect. Okay, so let's do this. Um, we would have had this conversation no matter what. Mm. We, would have, we would have spoken about this on Skype without recording it. True. So why not use a $30 recorder, <laughs> which I already had downloaded on my computer, and make a tribute to where every, everyone understands the magnitude of what Joe has created for us 
and also for us to pass along the knowledge to other people and give them their voice as well. And that's yeah. from Dr. Uh, Wayne Dyer, actually. But, <laughs> yeah, that's, but that's great, that, though. That's, I mean, that's, that's, that's the eight-pound, so better another man. person leaving a legacy. But it's, it's the same thing. So it didn't take any more effort. It didn't take any more time. But you can do a lot more good and help a lot more people, and everyone benefits that much more. So when you're thinking about your business, when you're thinking mm. about doing something, these are little things. I wonder if I could do it like this. Well, if I do it like this, five people are helped. If I do it like this... 100,000 people could be helped. All right, and then yeah. I'm going to do it that way. Yep. And you know what? You really hit on something in terms of even this video, shooting this. You contacted me yesterday. I mean, if I was of a different mindset, I'd be like, well, you know what? I, I've met you. I've spent some time with them. I've certainly been influenced, but I'm no Joe Weider expert. And, you know, and plus, I don't look that good on camera. And it's Sunday morning. I, I don't know. You know. And this is the kind of stuff that goes through a lot of people's minds. So, guys, when you hear yourself doing these things, when you, when you find yourself putting your own obstacles on the path of success, you got to say no. You got to shovel those aside and say, no, let's just do it. And, like John said, and I think it's so important to be able to think first, how many people, how can I impact that? How, Let's take this thing as big as we can go with this. You know, and there is something to be said for, hey, let's test the market. Let's get out there and test this thing, and then we'll grow it as we go. There's a lot to be said for that. But the overall, the bigger, the overarching mission and picture should be reach people on a massive scale, change lives in some way, shape, or form with what you do or how you do it. Because maybe you don't do anything particularly different than somebody else uh, uh, than somebody else does, but you do it in a different way. You deliver the message in a slightly different way that somebody else will get. And you have an opportunity to, to uh, really have an impact. And like John said, create a legacy, create you know, a I, dynasty. I have to correct myself earlier. I said Dr. Wayne Dyer, who was also a major influence in my life. But it was Dr. Stephen Covey. Covey. Who, who said, uh, who, who developed the, uh, the seven habits and, of course, the eight. Ah. And the one I was referencing, so, so for, forgive me for that. The one I was referencing is giving the, the, uh, the voice to someone else and, and, and allowing or empowering them to have their voice. Mm. And, that's what, mm. and that's what Joe has done for us. Uh, is allowed us to have our voice because if this industry wasn't created, at least mm. in, in large part to him, what I don't know if you and I would even be friends. I mean, not that you're yeah. not a nice guy, Tom. I just don't know if we would have met. <laughs> we'd probably be we probably be our rivals, enemies. Our, our, <laughs> <laughs> but in what industry? What would we be doing? Yeah, you know? Knows? Who knows? Yeah. And the other thing, the other thing too, John, that I wanted to you know for fitness professionals too, and this is something. That's, that's interesting. A good friend of mine, uh, Rich Gasparri, who also yeah, competed yeah. with me. You remember Richie. Richie was fantastic champion. He was second uh, two-time Mr. Olympia at least three times against Lee Haney. He won the Universe, the Mr. America. He won the National Championship the year before I did. And, uh, I mean, and just a good guy, but also a very successful entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And he's done something as well, or is continuing to do something that Weider was very good at. And this is something that we should all take a look at because at some point it may or may not be about me. It may not be about you. In other words, to get your message across, to deliver your product, to deliver your, your service, whatever it might be, maybe someone else, maybe something else is needed. Joe Weider knew he needed a vehicle. He had the vehicle, but he needed a face. Mm -hmm. And when he discovered Arnold Schwarzenegger, could there have been a better face? Could there have been a better physique? Could there have been a better person to help proliferate what he was already on a mission to do? Rich Gasparri is... I don't want to say using, but certainly putting in, in, into employ mm -hmm. successful bodybuilders like Flex Lewis, for example, today to help. It's not saying, hey, I need to be on all our products. I'm still in good shape at 50-something. No, it's about others now. It's about a new generation. And if I'm not reaching this generation personally, then I'm going to find someone who's going to help me deliver my message, product, and or service as a result of that and leave my ego out of it. It doesn't matter about that. Yeah, I, so sometimes, just saw, and, and, I just saw Rich Gaspari a couple weeks ago in L.A. Did you? He looks awesome. He looks great still. He looks yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Not as good as me. No, I take him no, no, no. Now, but, but he still looks good. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we, we, we got to wrap this thing up, but I want to make sure people can contact you because uh, Tom Terwilliger has a bunch of really cool stuff always happening. So how awesome. do they contact you? Well, you can certainly get uh, – it's the easiest place to go is to asktomlive.com. Ask tomlive.com. That'll take you to all of my social media uh, addresses, and it'll also give you some information on uh, how to find my book, Seven Rules of Achievement, Why Smart Goals May Be Dumb, all of that. So uh, uh, <laughs> I know you giggle at that, but you know the Why Smart Goals May Be Dumb book is, is, was my 
choice, by the way, going back just for a moment to what we talked about in terms of being controversial. Smart goals are the most used, prolific goal setting strategy in the coaching industry and has been for several years. And I feel that like they fall short a little bit. So I came up with my own in my in Seven Rules of Achievement and decided, hey, you know what? I'm not just going to follow suit. I'm going to say, hey, I think this is falling short. And they may be dumb. There may actually be a better solution for you. And it's the only way. I'm glad that, that book, by the way, has outsold our seven rules by about, you know, 100 times wow. because of its controversy. Uh-huh. So this is, again, going back to that lesson you talked about. you got to be a little bit controversial sometimes, you know? That's right. Just be cool in the process. All right, yeah, you guys. Exactly. Uh, Tom, thank you so much. You guys, Thanks, uh, John. Uh, make sure you uh, take a moment to appreciate Joe Weider. Uh, I know that we do. And uh, please leave some uh, comments and some likes and, and share this video and so we can uh, pass along the legacy. And make sure you create your own as well. Thanks yeah. a lot. I appreciate it. See you guys. Go get them.